Hello, this is Aaron Saft on the MR Running Pains podcast. With 30 years of running experience and 20 years of coaching, I thought it time to share with you things I've learned and people I've met so that you can try things for yourself and see if they help your running. Thanks for joining me. Wrote this song while crew and Aaron on a 100-mile foot race through the trails in the rain and mud. How about that? Christmas Eve. Welcome to episode number 45 of the MR Running Pays podcast. This is Aaron Saft once again with you. Um, I've got an episode today with um, two great people, uh, a husband and wife combination in Nate Heaslip and Jennifer Heaslip. Um, they are both endurance athletes. Um, Jennifer is well versed in um, ultra marathons and has done um, a few hundred milers herself, um, whereas Nate is new to the ultra running, at least, uh, having just completed the Art Loeb Trail. Um, they have a young son. Uh, he's middle school aged, uh, similar to my son. And um, today's conversation, we, we kind of talk about, you know, you know, all those things, how they juggle um, each being able to get out and train because um, Nate also cycles and, um, and does uh, some long rides. So how do they manage to, uh, you know, to maintain the, the family life and, um, you know, still get everything in um, and enjoy themselves and, um, you know, schedule races. So a real fun conversation. Um, I, you know, I really enjoy these two and I thank them for their time and uh, we'll catch up more at the end. So without further ado, Nate and Jennifer Heaslip. Hi, everybody. Uh, this is Aaron Saft here with Jen and Nate Heaslip. Uh, we are uh, talking about these two. They're uh, a married couple from here in Western North Carolina. And uh, I'm going to let them uh, introduce themselves. How are you guys today? Good. Hope you're well. Good. Doing good. Awesome. Um, Nate, uh, why don't you uh, start us off? Tell us a little bit about yourselves, uh, how long you've been married, uh, where you're from, all that good stuff. Yeah, sure. Uh, my name is Nathan or Nate Hayslip. Uh, we've been married for 17 years now, and um, 
We uh, currently uh, live in uh, Mills River, North Carolina. Um, I'm 43 years old. Uh, own a small business in uh, Brevard, uh, and uh, own and operate that. Um, background, kind of. I've lived in four different states growing up, and originally from Pennsylvania, and I've lived in New England and uh, West Virginia, and, and now North Carolina for quite a long time. Uh, so a little bit of a varied background for me. Um, as far as uh, just my athletic background and that, you know, wasn't a huge athlete growing up, just participated in normal team sports such as baseball, basketball. I'm, I'm over six foot four, so I was kind of uh, – basketball I was always recruited at. I remember I'm a tall guy. Uh, things like that. Uh, I was not into running as a child, uh, at least not any more than just normal running around and, and participating in these sports uh, and those things. Uh, and um, is you know really didn't get into athletics as an adult until I was in my uh, mid, approximately mid thirties. Uh, so around 2011 or so, uh, and. Um, uh, now I currently uh, do quite a bit of, uh, of running and trail running specifically uh, and cycling and, uh, and road cycling and do that. Uh, Excellent. Excellent. Um, and, and Jen, why don't you introduce yourself and then we'll, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about your uh, athletic endeavors. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I grew up in DC area until I went off to college in West Virginia. Um, we stayed there for, we met in college, so we stayed there for several years after that and then moved to eastern North Carolina and then came over to the mountains. So we've lived here um, 12 or 13 years now. Right on. For me, my athletic background was just typical tomboy. I played a lot of sports, swimming, basketball, uh, rode horses. I did like fencing and horses in college um, and running. Did a lot of running. Um, one of my favorite pastimes is grab that Walkman and my favorite tape and, and go and run around the neighborhood. That, that's you had the yellow sportsman. I did not. That cost more money. So I, <laughs> I had I had one of those. I did. <laughs> mm-hmm. I did not yeah, walk I <laughs> Do you remember when it changed to Discman? And uh, that was that was interesting to try to carry a Discman while you're running. That didn't work so well. I remember the, it would skip and <laughs> they were so bad for skipping. <laughs> oh my god! Then, then they came out with like the anti-skip, which I think it just clamped down the disc carter, but it didn't really work. Oh man! Good times. <laughs> oh, <not the memories. laughs> Good times. Um, anything else you want to add there, Jen? Um, no, that's pretty much it. Um, I'm a newspaper editor, so I work weird hours which makes running interesting um and like nate said he owns a small business so um it can get it can get challenging at times yeah we're going to talk about uh, your son here in a moment but um let's talk a little bit about um about running you know nate you kind of shared uh when you started uh, what was your first trail race Ooh. My first trail race, um, I believe it was actually the DuPont 12K that okay. uh, they have in the spring. I'm pretty yep. sure that was my first one. Okay. Um, for those that aren't local to you know Western North Carolina, DuPont State Forest is one of our um, popular tourist attractions uh, with multiple waterfalls. It's a gorgeous scenery. Um, if you've seen uh, Last of the Mohicans, uh, some of the uh, some of the you know, filming took place there. Uh, what else guys, um, hunger games, right. There wasn't there a scene from hunger games in there. And, uh, so multiple movies have shot in there, but, um, they have a cool little 12 K, uh, usually early spring. Um, and, uh, you know, who knows what 2021 will bring. Um, (laughs) but uh, it's a great local race. Um, how about you, Jen? Um, I ran, you know, like all my life, but I never did races until after I had Brendan, Um, so I think, I think my first trail race was, um, the DuPont half marathon. They brought that back for a year. It was the same year as the Boston marathon bombing. So I think that was 2013. Um, Okay. But that was my first actual race trail running. Right on. Yeah. DuPont (laughs) is a popular spot. (laughs) Um, so, uh, DuPont, let's see. Uh, I'm trying to remember. 
I think du- was DuPont might have been my first race here in Western North Carolina, my first trail race. Um, you know, obviously I'd been racing on the trails prior, but uh, that when I moved here in 2007, they had the trail marathon championships at DuPont. And I think that was my actual first race while living here in Western North Carolina. Um, so we all share that in common. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, how about uh, ultra? So um, your first ultra, uh, Jen, you want to start us off? Yeah, ultra is, uh, you know, it's funny. I didn't even know ultra running was a thing. I would just used to go off with my dog and had, like run all day. And I don't <laughs> remember how I learned that ultra running was this thing and it had athletes and races. Um, so I don't think that I ran a race, um, an ultra until 2017. I think it was Table Rock Ultra was my 50K was my first one. Okay, cool. Um, and Table Rock is um, uh, over by the Linville Gorge area. Um, North Carolina. Yep. Um, and so that's uh, one of the Tanawa Adventures. Um, again, for those not from the area, it's it's still here in Western North Carolina. Um, yeah, a little bit uh, north, what would that be northeast of us? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That sounds right our area um and uh ultra running is kind of new to you nate so tell us a little bit about that yeah um to be honest i like jen had never heard of ultra running before she started doing that um and um i always uh, would go with uh, brendan a lot of the times too and we would go uh support jen at her events even if it's just a spectate uh or to actually provide support or or uh or uh, crewing. Uh, but anyways, that, that was my first introduction to ultra running, ultra trail running specifically, uh, is learning through her and seeing these events and all these people and that do, do these amazing things. Um, I have very little ultra running experience. Uh, I got into trail running uh, in the last three years. And prior to this year, uh, my longest trail run was, was 30K, uh, with most of them being 20 to 25K races or events. Uh, and, um, then, uh, finally did, uh, our Lope trail, uh, this year, which, um, for my run anyways, ended up being about 29 miles, just over that, uh, to do. Awesome. 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 Yeah. Um, if you've listened to the show before, you've heard me talking about the art Lope trail, but very scenic trail here in, in Western North Carolina, um, uh, roughly 50 K in distance. Um, what did you get for vertical gain, Nate? About eight thousand seven hundred foot of vertical gain. Yeah, it sounds right. So around around nine thousand feet of uh, of gain. We'll we'll round up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it's a, it's just a great great trail, point to point. Um, you know, it's it's a tough one to do uh, as the winter wears on, just because of the higher elevations. It can become quite icy, especially as you approach the parkway and get out into those higher elevations up in the. Uh, by the black balsam area and such, but, um, you did it just, uh, what, two weeks ago, uh, as we're recording this. Yeah, that's, that's right. Uh, I did. And, uh, you're right about the timing of the year is probably not the best, um, short days with sunlight and, uh, and definitely things like ice, uh, in this case, parkway was closed as well. Um, that we ran into a thing. So I, I actually started uh, a little over an hour before sunrise started, uh, in that morning and, uh, was able to then finish in mid afternoon with plenty of sunlight left, uh, at the end of the run. And, uh, yeah, there was definitely ice. Cool. Um, well, uh, let's touch on that for a second. If you don't mind holding off there, Jen, or you can chime in here and, and help with us, um, talking about this, but, um, with the parkway closed, um, the parkway is a, like, it's almost midway. It's maybe a little further than midway. Um, but how did, uh, like, how did you do it? Unsupported or did Jen meet you somewhere else? Did you go off-road and bust through a gate, Jen? What did you do? <laughs> go ahead, Jen. What did, what did you do? Well, being the um, incredible planners that we are, we had everything nailed down. We had figured out what we were going to do, where we were going to meet. And then um, neither of us checked to see if the parkway was open. <laughs> <laughs> well, we roll. Uh, so, 
So yeah, I pull up um, to the intersection of 215 where it runs into the parkway and all the gates are closed everywhere. <laughs> and there's no cell reception there unless you stand in the middle of the center island and you like lift one leg and <laughs> the left, you might get through. So I couldn't reach him, but um, yeah. So I had to, I tried to call a friend to see if it was open the 276 way, a different way. And um, after many hangups, you know, she said no. And so, uh, and also I had told Nate I was coming the 276 way. I hadn't told him I was taking the different road. Um, so he didn't know where I was coming from. <laughs> so just it, in the last minute, I just like loaded up a backpack full of water and food and just started running down the parkway with all this stuff and my dog and, you know, and people are stopping me to ask, like, is it really closed? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> Gates are really <laughs> um, and just started running toward him and trying to call. I didn't want to alarm him, but I had to let him know, like, just wait, I'm coming. Cause we were supposed to meet somewhere else. And I was like, you know, don't meet me at black balsam. Just stop when you get to the parkway, but we couldn't connect by, via phone very easily. So I think he got the message and I just had to like bust my butt and get to, where Art like the parkway and hope that he understood that what I was what I was saying or that I could get there before he crossed. So that was a little stressful. <laughs> did you did you have to wait a little bit, Nate? No, she beat me there by she swears about two minutes. Oh wow! Um, <laughs> yeah, and uh, so from my half of the of this part of this uh, this uh, adventure uh, of things, um, our original I, it was a supported run was always our plan. And uh, she was to meet me first at uh, Gloyster Gap, which went normal and fine. And uh, then the next meeting was going to be where the Art Loeb Trail uh, crosses over the uh, road. I think it's maybe 816 or 826 uh, out to uh, Black Balsam parking lot. And um, I was uh, around uh, Farlow Gap on my run. Uh, and I started getting phone calls, uh, and I could feel my phone vibrating in, in my vest. And, uh, here I finally decided to look down while I'm running and, uh, I see it's Jen. So I know there's something's not right. Uh, and I think we played phone tag six or seven times trying to get reception between the two of us. And I finally got the, the, the gist of it that the parkway was closed. However, so I immediately, so two things here is I didn't, I, I immediately thought, okay, backup plan is her and I will meet uh, right where we did meet, where the, where uh, our load crosses the parkway at. So I knew that and uh, we were going to do that. However, I thought she was coming from the 276 way. So in my head, I was thinking, well, if I get up to the parkway and I don't see her, I'm going to start running on the parkway, but it would have been in the wrong direction. I would have run to a bigger <laughs> field exactly in 276. That way I could help help meet her because I didn't know how far in she was walking. Right. So thank goodness she actually did beat me. Otherwise, yeah, there would have been some extra miles, of course, added onto this run. Right. And I, I would have been going the wrong direction. What, was there some ice up there when you crossed the parkway? There was, I didn't see any on the parkway at that part, but there was definitely ice up above, uh, right on the other side of Tennant, especially. So when you go over Black Balsam and you go over Tennant Mountain, uh, it was actually thick enough on the backside of Tenant. There was one section I had to slide down on my bottom, uh, oh, like an ice, like a, literally an ice luge. There was yep. just no traction. The ice was so thick. Uh, it was the easiest thing I could do. So that was a little different yep. too. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, for those that don't know, uh, the parkway that we're referring to is the Blue Ridge Parkway. And uh, since this is such high elevation, um, you know, we're talking between five and 6,000 feet at some points on the parkway. Um, it, it, uh, closes down, um, with the slightest, um, threat of, um, of rain or, uh, you know, of, of course, ice or snow, uh, when we get to the winters. And a lot of times they just close sections of it for the winter just because it becomes a little bit more hazardous. So, um, that must've been a, that must've been a nightmare coming to that gate, Jen. Uh, my gosh. Uh, yeah. but, uh, geez. Well, I'm, I'm glad that you were able to to catch him and, and get him the supplies that he needed. That's fantastic. Um, yeah, because he had another, what, 13 miles, and he was almost out of water. So yeah, the pull out the map, panic. But, yeah, right. we were on the same wavelength, at least, so that worked. Good. Nate, did you, go ahead, Jen. I'm sorry. 
Just always check the parkway if you're going past October. It was yep. a beautiful day, <laughs> weather-wise. Yeah. Yep. We've been stuck up there waiting for my wife to get up there just because it takes so long and we got there faster than she anticipated. And, you know, it, it's, we've been, we've done it in December and, uh, you know, we're waiting at black balsam and, you know, you're just hiding in the trees up there just because the wind is just howling. It, it always windy up there. Um, but, um, yeah, it is beautiful. Um, did you have any filters or anything, Nate? Did you bring any, like a filter with you? No, I did not. Um, I did have water tablets uh, to dissolve uh, to, to cover it as backup. So uh, I could have uh, done it that way. Uh, and I also had plenty of extra nutrition uh, on me, too. So I was okay nutrition-wise, but water was definitely yeah. going to be an issue. I only had two tablets, right. and there was still water running on top at certain places. Uh, but it wasn't as uh, plentiful as it would be other times of the year. And obviously, yeah. it was frozen, too. Yep. Yeah, there's there's that one spring kind of as you get into the Shining Rock Wilderness area. Um, and then there's another one if you actually start going up um, the cold mountain, you know, like it's it's right after you turn to go down to the Boy Scout camp. If you were to actually keep going and go up cold mountain, it's about a mile up. There's another spring. Um, but yeah, it's, it is limited up there, especially this time of year when everything starts freezing. Um, but we'll we'll touch on uh, Art Loeb a little bit more um, in a little bit. Um, but Jen, how about you? What's your, uh, what's your longest distance to date? A uh, hundred miles. So I've gotten into a couple of hundred miles here. So that's my longest. Awesome. Awesome. Um, and, um, let's see, we've gone over some good things on, uh, on both of you. Let's talk about, uh, your son. Let's talk about, uh, Brendan. How old is Brendan? Uh, Brendan is 13, so we're, we just entered the teenage years. This should be interesting. Um, and <laughs> he's not into running or the outdoors at all, so I don't know how, where his genes and have to skip to generation. Uh, he's perfectly happy to just stay in his pajamas and not go out <laughs> and walk the dog. So uh, he's, he's just a very creative, very imaginative kid. He's into like World War II and history and maps. And for some reason, Minecraft is making a comeback, but uh, I've noticed that he's not going to be joining. He goes to the same son or same school as your son, but you won't see him on that cross country course. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Fair <laughs> enough. Um, Nate uh, had mentioned that he has crewed for, for you in the past. Um, what, what uh, events has he been at? Is Nate, are you with us? Yeah, I'm still with you. I'm sorry. Okay. I thought uh, you were asking Jen. My apologies. Uh, no, no, I thought you were just so quiet. <laughs> uh, no, no, it's my, my fault. Uh, I've crewed uh, Jen for the No Business 100 over in Kentucky. Uh, I have also more recently crewed her for uh, Rim to River in West Virginia. That was this year. Um, I think those, and uh, I've Crewed her for the uh, Georgia Jewel as well uh, in Georgia. And was was um, Brennan with uh, with you for any of those? Brennan was not with me for any of those. Uh, we usually uh, have him stay either with uh, grandparents uh, for something like that, uh, and or with uh, friends, um, simply because of the for the ultra for the hundreds at least. Um, the time commitment, sometimes the remote locations that are involved, um, a large amount of driving, just the logistics of things uh, on those events. He has been with me and has gone to shorter ultras in the 50K range, for example, and that the Jen is. Okay. Nice. Cool. Um, Jen, when um, when you are racing and, and Brendan is there, um, are you able to still focus okay during the race? Yeah, because I know – I know Nate's got him. <laughs> so, you trust him? Yeah. <laughs> it took about 10 years, but <laughs> he's just said he's been okay. So yeah, I, I try not to um, not to worry too much about him because I know he's going to be okay. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Yeah, I, I uh, you know, I, I have to give kudos to, to my wife um, for, you know, putting up with, with my two kids, um, especially – you know, last year at UTMB, um, I mean, she, you know, she hopped on a bus, God knows how many times to meet me. 
in three different countries. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's, uh, she is, uh, she is more than a trooper. Uh, my son was so, um, delusional that he was not making any sense. Um, <laughs> he was so tired, you know, he was saying stuff and my wife's just like, just stand up. <laughs> you know, he was just, you know, he was so out of it. Uh, but, um, no, it's, you know, it, it's good that, you know, your limitations and, you know, Brennan's limitations, uh, cause ultras, obviously even hundred milers, they, uh, they can be extremely long and it's, it's tough. Um, in another regard too, for the kids in that they watch you suffer, <laughs> you know, I mean, they, they can see you visually suffer and know you're in pain. Um, uh, you know, um, like, I mean, uh, I think back to uh, bighorn where my hamstrings, you could, you know, physically see my hamstrings locking up. They were cramping so bad. You could see they look like ropes and my kids, I could just see their faces and they were wincing just like, Oh my God. And, you know, they were asking my wife, like, why doesn't he stop? And, you know, my wife being typical saying, well, he's an idiot, you know, like that's why he doesn't stop. Like, <laughs> not that I needed my hard rock qualifier or anything like that. It's just that I'm an idiot and I am, but, uh, but yeah, it's, that's tough in that regard too. Cause you want to come in, you want to be happy. You want to be smiling, you know, like at least put on that face that, you know, everything's okay. Cause it's your kids, you know, but, um, you know, the reality is that, and you know, they get to see that reality. Um, but, uh, so yeah, it can be a good thing not to have them there. That's for sure. Uh, it took me a while to be okay with them, uh, you know, being there and, and, uh, and not worrying about them knowing that they're with my wife and, you know, um, but oh, for sure. Um, and you know, you both, obviously you're both working, um, uh, Jen, you just finished up a master's degree. Um, I mean, you guys are, you're, you're busy. Um, and you know, you've got, uh, training that you want to do. How do you guys, how do you make it work? What do you guys do? You know, things you guys do to make it work. You want to start on this, Jen? <laughs> All right. So, uh, several things that we do, um, that I can think of, uh, off the top of my head. Um, we, we communicate very well, uh, and people that, uh, married couples uh, that have been married 17 years, hopefully do communicate very well in, in all aspects <laughs> of their, of their marriage. But when it comes to the training part of it, we also try to communicate very well. So that usually starts at during a normal non COVID year. That usually starts at the beginning of the year or right around now when lotteries are opening up for ultra running and uh, events are uh, becoming available for uh, biking or other events that I'm interested in doing too. And we openly start talking about uh, usually our A race for the year uh, and the important ones there, what that would be, where it would be at, and of uh, and of course, when that would be. Uh, and so that way, the other person has an idea of that when they're looking at events and things too, uh, to uh, to uh, work out that part of the schedule. So we kind of start that way uh, overall at the beginning of the year. And then um, and then as the year goes on uh, and we'll have maybe B and C races, for example, or events leading up to our to our main events. Uh, is we get closer to those and signing up and doing those within a month or so, let's say, uh, we'll alert each other to what's going on there. And then I guess finally to break it down more onto a, a weekly basis, let's say, or even a daily basis, uh, we usually talk over a weekend uh, and our training schedules usually start on Mondays uh, for us. And what's going on that week? Are there, are there important more important workouts on certain days that one of us has to do versus the other, and then trying to fit that into our lives in Brendan's life as well. Uh, and how we're going to handle that. Um, when he's younger, it used to mean one person, Oh, go into the treadmill at the YMCA, for example, at this time. And the other person then uh, going after that person and then picking him up at, at that, you know, like literally a handoff uh, uh, in that regard, for example, same thing goes with, with when we're actively outside too. But one thing that's changed more recently now that he's 13, as Jen mentioned, and he's gotten older is, is that we've become more comfortable with being able to leave him alone at home. Uh, he has a cell phone for communication with emergency numbers and contacts. We still tend to like though, to have at least one of us in cell phone range. So whether that means it's myself on a road bike and I'm in range, uh, the whole time while Jen's in the woods, for example, or vice versa, uh, we'll do that. When he was younger, we would more or less, one of us would be at the house, of course, with him. And we would alternate uh, uh, that way 
uh, with things. Right on. Jen, you have anything to add? Uh, no, just also we would divide the weekends. I think that was the, hmm. you know, we knew if we could get through the week, we'd be all right. And on the weekend, like Saturday was his day because he had a cycling group that he rides with. And that's, hey, whatever you want to do Saturday, I'll work around you. But then I get Sunday and you're going to have to work around me on Sunday. So we just yeah. kind of split up the time, made sure everybody got time to their training. Yep. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, you know, as I've kind of said in the past too, my, my treadmill has been like <laughs> the most useful thing that, <laughs> that I have for, you know, for having kids. Cause I mean, you know, just, I wouldn't be able to do a lot of it with, uh, with my wife's schedule. Um, you know, it's just, she's gone at seven 30 and doesn't get home until eight usually. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, it's, I, you know, some of these long runs that I have during the week, it's, you know, I wouldn't be able to get them in if I didn't have my treadmill because then they can just come downstairs and, you know, grab me if they really need me. So um, either that or like I did yesterday, you know, I have a half mile dirt road and I just went back and forth and <laughs> until I hit 15 miles <laughs> and that way I was right outside if they needed me. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, you do what you have to do when you have kids, you know, it's, uh, you have to be accessible um, and available. Um yeah, it's uh, it, it, those days where you can get out, just like you said, though, that's <laughs> that you look forward to those for sure. I mean, yeah, you gotta, gotta stay sane. Um, yeah, but oh, yeah, totally. Neighborhood laps, I think sometimes my neighbors may think that we're nuts because they'll see us uh doing laps in the neighborhood, for example, where we're at, you know, we'll, <laughs> we'll see you a bunch of times depending yeah. on what, you, what it is you're working on, so. Yeah. 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 I always feel like uh national lampoons, European vacation, you know, <laughs> look at big Ben parliament. <laughs> <laughs> Just keep going by the same spot. Thank God I live in a, on a pretty road, you know, the, the Mills river is right next to me. Uh, so it's at least pretty to look at, but yeah, yesterday I was going a little bit nuts. Um, that's uh, it was um, worked out to be 12, yeah, 12 laps back and forth on my road. Uh, oh, wow. And uh, yeah, by the time I got to 10, I was, I was like, man, you know, like, God, I can't imagine trying to do, uh, you know, uh, a, you know, a, a 50 K on this road. That would be 24 laps. And yeah, you can't like, I don't, I couldn't leave him alone with a sibling. I don't know about, you know, your kids, but I remember growing up, my parents couldn't leave us alone until we were like high school. Cause we'd kill each other. Yeah. Yeah, well, <laughs> I, like I, when I leave, I make sure that they are in separate parts of the house, and that you know my daughter stays away because she's typically the one that pushes the buttons. Yeah. Um, you know, <laughs> I mean, my, my son can be an instigator as well, but um, you know, like my def, my daughter definitely knows how to uh, push the buttons and make it look like it was his fault. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I try to make sure they're in separate parts of the house, and you know that they are entertained or have something to do. Um, you know, cause, uh, uh, idle hands, we all know the idle hands make the devil's work. It's, uh, <laughs> it's crazy, but, but they, yeah, they're, they're, um, you know, they're pretty good. Um, you know, they've, um, they've, they've definitely matured quite a bit, but I do worry sometimes that, you know, sometimes I'll even call everybody still alive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, we're the same way. My son has a, a cell phone and, uh, we, we actually got a, a, a house line, uh, just in case, you know, my daughter needs to, to call if I'm, you know, out on the road or something. So, um, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's definitely one of those, you know, well, let's see what we come home to. <laughs> <laughs> Tell Miles he's in charge. Just say, Hey. Are yeah. You yeah. Uh, you know, he's, uh, he comes out for, you know, some of the run and then, uh, I'll drop him off just so, you know, he's not running too much. He doesn't like the dirt roads so much with his paws. Um, so he, he does a little bit with me and then I drop him off and, you know, he checks on the kids for me. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of peek my head in and just make sure everybody, okay. Anybody need anything? And, you know, back out, I go. Yeah. Um, Any blood? Okay. We're good. Yeah. 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 Otherwise, like I said, you know, it's it, like this morning I, I, I popped on the treadmill at about five thirty, and I got in my, my run and thankfully they were off this morning. So, um, you know, they were, they were still sleeping. Uh, by the time I finished. So that was kind of nice, <laughs> but uh, yeah, do what we got to do, do what we got to do. Um, so um, any other tips for, for time management that you guys can think of? Um, got anything else there? 
know, just hire babysitters. We we did our share of hiring babysitters just so we could go out to run and bike at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> we can't yeah. take advantage of that YMCA child care when we could, but it's it's hard. I couldn't have done this volume of training when he was a toddler and I didn't really even start. I took a four year break from pregnancy till he went to preschool and I didn't really start running till he was like three and a half again. And even then he had so much, um, like he had some medical issues and therapy and it just wouldn't have been possible when he was a toddler. So, you know, just, you gotta put family first and don't, you know, there'll be time to run and and enjoy the moments you can get and, you know, there's, there'll yeah. be time to, to run later. So uh, you, everyone with a toddler trying to run has my sympathy because um, until he went to preschool, you know, it wouldn't have happened without putting him in childcare a significant amount of time, which I didn't want to do. Yeah. Just for situation, everyone's different, but right. you know, hang in there. It'll get better. They, they do. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yep. No, as, as soon as he had a, uh, a stable neck and was able to hold his neck up, that dude was in a baby jogger and, and we were hit, <laughs> we hit some trails. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. We, uh, we would have him out. He, he actually loved it. Cause you know, if we did single track, he was, making turns and hitting bumps and he, he thought it was a funny thing. And then if we got on a gravel road, we got into that. And then all of a sudden he'd stop and you look over and he's asleep, you know? Um, and then, uh, by the time my, uh, my daughter came around, um, you know, I, I finally had family in the area because when we, we moved here, I didn't have any family in the area. And thankfully, you know, they, they came to the area after she was born. And then I had a, I had an extra set of hands, <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's, it's hard. Yeah, that's family, hard. family or friends in the area, that's always helpful. Uh, we don't have immediate family in the area, uh, even at this point. But if you've got even, you know, friends, whether other parents, especially uh, in that, uh, that you can lean on, uh, that's always helpful uh, or can be uh, for, for, for doing sure. some things. Yeah. For sure. Especially if uh, they're, they're athletes themselves, you can trade off. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's for sure. Um so Jen, um, I know you've got, we talked about, um, your, uh, your 2021 a bit and, uh, you've got some things that you were thinking about. Um, have you shared those, um, with Nate? Um, uh, basically yeah, I told him that I want to do Pitchell's my big one every year, every October. I'm like, I'm going to do it. I'm going to, I'm going to do it. Yeah. It's going to happen. And October is a very hard month for us. We have two birthdays and an anniversary and it just never happened. So I was like, I'm going to do Pitchell. Art Lowe would be a great lead up to Pitchell. Um, and then Foothills Trail has always caught my attention. I really want to look at the trails out in that system. So then I was thinking about how about Foothills. So just sticking close to home and doing these locally iconic races that, you know, I live here and I haven't done yet, including Art Lowe. I mean, my husband, who didn't run ultras until this year and is a, you know, <laughs> cycle pro <laughs> I had run art lobe and I have not yet. So uh, that's, that's kind of my goal for 2021 is, but that's what I said for this year too. So now I, I have a coach, right? So it'll, <laughs> it'll finally happen. <laughs> yep. Yep. Uh, we'll, we'll touch on the, the coaching aspect in a little bit here. Um, but Nate, hearing some of these things, anything that uh, you think you want to join in? Oh, wow. Um, well, I mean, I don't mind helping her and or crewing her for any of these events uh, that she'd like to do uh, or runs and uh, and help her in that regard. Um, you know, Pitchell piques my interest somewhat, too. I think I'd like to see her do it first uh, since I've never actually seen anyone that does it. I know you've done it several times and, and I've li definitely listened to, to quite a few people that have in that. And, and uh, boy, it, it looks and sounds tough. Uh, so I, I'd, I'd, uh, I might be interested in something like that in the future, uh, but uh, nothing specific yet as far as that goes. Uh, I guess we'll see how 2021 ends up with events and other things, too, related to COVID and, and, yeah. and, and, and everything going yep. on. Yep. Um, no, that's for sure. Um, do you have any events that you're thinking about for 2021 or – yeah, I do. Uh, although they're not running right now, uh, I signed up for um, a very famous uh, gravel bike ride called the Belgian Waffle Ride uh, that originally started in uh, California. Uh, and they expanded, uh, I, ironically, they expanded last year to the Asheville area uh, for the first time. They did not have the event. Uh, it was canceled. 
but it's this really big, uh, long endurance uh, bike ride. Uh, it's about 143 miles. It'll take place in May. And I am signed up for that this year uh, to be planning on training and working towards that, which is that's that's hard in the world of cycling to do that type of stuff. Um, so I, I am signed up for that for sure. And my fingers are crossed. It's, uh, some of the trail race uh, events do happen and are opened. Um, I really like to do stuff like Grand Further Mountain. Seven Sisters is always a good uh, one that I enjoyed. Uh, even Cradle to Grave is, is a lot of fun, too, if, if some of these things happen this year or not. That's I'm not right. sure. Yeah. It's, it seems kind of um, <clears throat> hit or miss at the moment. And it, it's really – it's coming down to the uh, permitting agencies – um, you know, as to whether they want to, um, allow events, um, you know, for instance, um, I know Hellbender was having such a hard time because, um, at the, the usual time of year, which would be, um, April, um, the, um, again, the Blue Ridge Parkway is not permitting, uh, more than 50 people, um, in an event, um, or, you know, to, uh, access the, uh, the, uh, the parkway or the crossings, if you will. So, um, you know, it, it made it very difficult for, for Hellbender. So they were trying to move it to later in the year. Um, and, you know, I, I think they're, they're trying to figure out what they're doing, you know, but we should hear more. Uh, I think they're trying to make a decision by, uh, by January and announce what they're doing, uh, for Hellbender. Um, but, um, yeah, it's just, it's hard, uh, you know, right now, uh, and I mean, wisely so, you know, we, we, we're trying to, um, ascertain, um, you know, what's, what's safe, you know, and great article. I don't know if either of you read ultra running magazine, but there was a great article in there by a, uh, a physician, um, uh, that, that talked about, uh, why we should have, uh, trail races, you know, what, what, you know, what dangers do they actually present? Um, and you know, how dangerous are they? Uh, what, you know, steps can they take to make them even less dangerous? So, I mean, you know, great article, uh, you know, it's, it's the current publication, the current month's, uh, issue. Um, and you know, it gives me hope. Um, but that said, it's, it's to people's level of comfort, right? Um, do people feel comfortable going out and racing? You know, um, I decided not to race this weekend myself just cause you know, I, I didn't feel comfortable. So it's, you know, but whereas, you know, I raced a little while ago in November, uh, you know, and it's just, it's amazing how quickly things change. But, Definitely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so um, talking about events, um, what's, uh, what's, what inspires and motivates you guys? What, what makes you want to do these things? Um, well, for me, I just love running. This is something I've done for all my life. I can't imagine not doing it and just trying to like, what's your why? I just like being in motion, I think is what I finally figured out. Just like being out there in the woods. I run with my dog. So you know, that way he gets exercise, I get exercise and we're just, you know, in our happy place. It's, it's my stress reliever. How many people are going to come track me down from work in the woods? I don't have to worry about that. And then as far as racing, I mean, it's new to me since, I didn't do races and didn't know they were a thing. <laughs> so I like the challenge of it. I like, okay, I finished one thing. Now what, what else can I accomplish? And I don't know. That's my motivation is to stay healthy as well because, you know, everyone has getting older and facing health issues. It keeps me sane and stress-free. Um, so all, all the, the kind of typical reasons, but just getting to spend time in nature with my dog and yeah. some alone time. <laughs> Um, Great. And the social nature too, because since I do the majority of my runs alone, um, races, I mean, to me, they're just like social get togethers. They're <laughs> I get to run with my husband, which we don't actually get to run together very often until this year. And I get to see people that I've met over the years or Facebook friends. So another motivation is just to have that contact since I run alone so much. Sure. Um, can you touch on that? Because that's been a, a topic that has kind of popped up a few times here recently. We talked, um, I talked with Abby Harris about it and I talked with um, um, Ann Riddle about it. Um, and, you know, they have a level of comfort um, that, you know, we typically hear, um, be it through, you know, the media and social media that 
Um, you know, there's a lot of women that are just uncomfortable with being um, alone on the trails. Um, can you just speak to that and, you know, um, how you, you know, belay those fears or uh, have overcome them or if they never really even existed? <laughs> yeah, I haven't, I can't say I've really uh, had those fears in, in a major way. I, we, I grew up, I was born in D.C. and we lived in Maryland outside D.C., but and so it was a city environment or suburban environment, but we had um, a backyard that backed up to the woods. And okay, this is DC, it's probably a couple acres, but it backed up to an archery range. So there had to be certain small acreage buffer between our neighborhood and this uh, shooting range. And I mean, just from the time I was little, I was in the woods constantly. I just always felt at home there. And I remember one time I went out with a friend and I was like look at this cool stream and she was hungry and I was like well I'll run back home and get some food and I came back and she's just beside herself like freaking out because I left her alone in the woods and it never occurred to me that that was scary <laughs> I just thought oh. we're, we're awesome so it wasn't until I got older and started to learn about things that happened to women that I started to second guess myself like am I safe here um I got to do my research and and, you know, when you actually start looking at it, with a really less safe, um, I think most people, when you think of what can happen to runners, you get hit by cars. And then there's all the horror stories for women about just run-ins with men or abductions or assaults. But you don't really hear about that in the woods. So I actually feel safer trail running. I don't really, I, I fear more that I'm going to break my leg or <laughs> something like that. Um, more than I've ever felt um, unsafe. But I also think, and I'll summarize this quickly because I know I'm going off script. I've talked to a lot of women about this because it's intrigued me. And I was like, well, why won't you come run with me? Like, what are you afraid of? And it's still in our culture that women are kind of in charge of the kids or it's not always true. But when I run with women, they're like, well, if something happens to me out here, I won't be able to get my child or they'll call me first or, you know, there's all these worries beyond just being attacked in the woods. It's also that you're the, the contact for your kid. You're the mom. You know, what, what if something happens to me out there? What if I get lost and the kids freak out? And so it's, that's just a big question for how do we approach women, women and get them into running and safety and, just feeling like the woods is a safe place and you are not alone in being the sole provider for your children. <laughs> Cause even though like I know Nate's there and he's a great dad, you know, there's still times in my head, I'm like, yeah, if he's at work and I take off at lunch to go run and something happens to me, is my kid going to freak out or will I be able to get back in time for a school event or right. So it's everything from the safety to the weight of responsibility. But for me, I just grew up in that little patch of woods and, I never thought to be afraid of it. So yeah, it's interesting. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Um, well, thank you. Uh, that's great. Um, the, uh, um, you know, being, being alone is definitely, um, it's tough, especially, you know, in, in areas we don't know. And I think that's what becomes part of the, the growing concern is, you know, I don't know the woods. I don't know the trails. Um, you know, it's, it's the unknown that we, we kind of fear it's kind of like doing some of your first night running, you know, when you, uh, you know, go mm -hmm. out for your first night run yeah, I, males, you know, myself included, you know, when, when I first started night running, it was like a, a whole new experience. It, you know, once we don't have that visual cues of what daylight gives us, you know, we start wondering what's going bump in the dark next to us. <laughs> yeah. So I, you know, I can relate to a certain extent, uh, the fear and, uh, you know, the uh, trepidation of, of going out and being in the woods um, with all of the unknowns around you. So, I, you know, it's I, what I would say is just do it in small increments, you know, um, go out on a group hike, get to know the get to know the trails or get to know people, you know, that you can go out with um, and see the trails. So you become a little bit more familiar with them, a little bit more comfortable with them, um, you know, um, as you start to use them more and more you'll notice that you see the same faces because people primarily follow the same schedule. So, you know, uh, you'll be waving at the same person. Um, 
but um yeah <laughs> it's not always safe if you're a woman like if you're running the same uh, that see I've, I've been more scared of running the same route through a park or something every day you know that gets scary um yeah but it's a good conversation to have for night running i did my first night run at a race because i was like i've never run through the night i was more worried about like my headlamp and <laughs> that and I, so i did my first night run at a race and that kind of gave me confidence it made me realize i really enjoy running at night it's so peaceful um yep. all myself every all the animals are asleep <laughs> Except just last night running we were running my dog and i in the dark and i hear a sound and i swivel around my headlamp and i see these eyes and i'm like ah. and i was like oh it's my dog so <laughs> I freaked out over carter <laughs> it just takes experience to to get out there and do it <laughs> yep yep absolutely um, and how about for you, Nate, what's, uh, what's your inspiration and motivation, especially to take on, um, did you say it's 147 mile gravel? Uh, I think it's 143 mile. If I, I think and my inspiration and motivation, a lot of it is the same as Jen's, but, uh, I like to challenge. Um, uh, I was always, even though I didn't do a lot of athletics as a, as a kid, I was always very comfortable in the woods and I grew up in, uh, rural areas, and uh, we did as families a lot of camping and a lot of hiking growing up uh, in the green uh, mountains of, of uh, Vermont, the Adirondacks in New York, for example, but other places as well, West Virginia, Pennsylvania, too. <clears throat> so was, I've always been comfortable out in the woods, and I've always, just as Jenna said, uh, I've enjoyed the woods. It's a relaxing place to be for me. Um, I, I just feel like that I get out there and I unwind and, uh, love to enjoy nature. Uh, what's going on, the beautiful views. I, I take a lot of pictures, uh, at times when I'm out there, uh, and, uh, those continue to specifically motivate me for that, for the, you know, events and races and challenges and that I, I'm, a uh, I'm a competitive person, uh, in my personality. Uh, I like, to do something hard and prove that I can do it. And then I like to work uh, through the process of, of trying to achieve that and do it as well as I possibly can. Uh, and that's a lot of my motivation. I like to find new things to do too. Um, this gravel event will be the first uh, gravel event that I've ever done in my entire life on a bike, for example. And uh, it's one of the hardest ones there is. Uh, so, um, uh, I'm, I'm definitely biting off a lot. Uh, I guess kind of similar to Arlo. I've never done a, uh, an ultra before in, uh, in trail running and, um, it's not easy. I can, I can say that for sure. Just as a pure novice anyways, um, uh, it's tough going from, uh, Davidson river up over and in, into camp Daniel Boone. Um, that's, that's definitely not an easy one. I, in retrospect, maybe I should have just picked a track to run 50 K on and, and <laughs> gone around in circles. <laughs> <laughs> no, absolutely. Well, yeah, let's let's spin off that a little bit and and talk about you know what you did. Um, you know, obviously, you know, Art Loeb, you know, roughly 50k is it's a new distance to you. Um, you do still use cycling um as part of your training, correct? I do, yes, absolutely. Yeah, so let's talk about that a little bit. I, I'm I'm always love to hear stories about how people use um, you know, cycling, for instance, as a, a means to enhance fitness. Sure. Absolutely. I, first of all, think that, uh, cycling and running, uh, complement each other, uh, in many ways. And that, um, some of the things that, that cross over is the big aerobic engine that you'll develop, uh, through either sport, for example. Uh, but that definitely translates over to the other one, uh, very easily. So if you've been, uh, in my case, an experienced cyclist uh, coming from uh, years of that background before I really got into to trail running specifically, I already had a big aerobic engine. Uh, I could get out there and I could I could run. Um, I could outrun what my body was capable of handling, for example, when I first started trail running, uh, because they're so different, because you have load on your legs, on your joints, uh, all your tendons and, and ligaments and things when you're running. Uh, that was always and, and still is my biggest holdback related to the running part of it. I had to be careful about ramping up uh, my running specifically to not get injured. So it's more the musculoskeletal system that needs to catch up. Your aerobic capacity is much mm -hmm. higher. Yes. 
Yes, exactly. We just don't have that impact in cycling and coming from that background. So um, that's that's a big uh, thing to to adjust to in your training and and in your running. In that, um, it's fairly easy to bump up your cycling distances uh, compared certainly compared to to uh, trail running. Um, so that, that kind of crosses over. Now, uh, another thing I've noticed is, is that I've gotten better at, uh, cycling and actually my aerobic fitness, in my opinion, is, has gotten better through, uh, running, uh, differences there to me anyways, are that when you're cycling, you get breaks, there's a downhill where you may end up coasting part of it, or you're riding in a race or a group ride, and you're not going to be there constantly pumping out the same amount of effort or watts or however you'd like to measure it through the entire uh, duration of that event. It's going to vary some. That's different with running. If you run down a hill, trail running, yeah, it does get a little bit easier, but you're still working. Um, There's still, uh, you know, you still have things going on there and uh, you get a much more constant aerobic workout uh, running and trail running versus cycling. And, and you can run for a much shorter duration of time, for example, versus cycling to get a similar benefit and, and the chiefs, uh, things like that. Right. Right. And, and Jen, you had, uh, we started, um, with coaching this year. Um, but as I remember it, I think on Thursdays you were doing, um, uh, cycling. Was it a series that you were doing? Uh, I got talked into um, a couple of time trials on the bike. Um, um, so, yeah, I, I did a um, two time trials locally on the road bike. <laughs> uh, do you like cycling as well? Uh, I, I do. I got into triathlons after when I did start running again. After having Brendan, I couldn't couldn't run back to back days like my friends were because I had some awesome knees. I uh, had to build up to it, so I decided, well, I already swim and run. I'll just try biking. How hard can it be? Uh, apparently, it's very hard <laughs> for me. <laughs> <laughs> I am not a cyclist, but I do enjoy it. I love the freedom of it. I love even the speed of just cruising down the the roads. But after a couple of years of training for like half Ironmans, I got really tired of the bike workouts and realized I like to ride my bike, but I don't like to train on the bike. <laughs> <laughs> so with COVID this year, I just uh, said, "Hey, I'll, I'll try some of these time trials." So that's what that was. Nice, because it you know it after that it kind of disappeared again. Yeah. Uh, is that something you miss? It is. Cycling comes and goes. I like having it in the garage, knowing I can pull the bike out. But it's not something I do consistently. I kind of figure, you know, when I've killed my body on all these trails and everything, then I can. <laughs> but I mean, Nate is very good at cycling and he is very competitive and he's done like the hundred mile assault on Mount Mitchell and the off-road assault. Like for me, it is just, it does not come naturally. So I've decided that, you know, it's just something I'll do for fun whenever <laughs> it's, but that that's about it for me in cycling. <laughs> uh, well, and you know, Nate is, it's kind of interesting because you're not per se new to trail running. You've, you, as you've mentioned, you've been trail running for, for some years, but um, you know, what's some things that you might share with those that are just starting up? Do you have some um, suggestions as to things you might um, tell a new trail runner, somebody that's, you know, uh, inexperienced with, uh, um, you know, maybe they're coming from the road or, uh, you know, they're, they've been cycling, um, but they want to try trail running. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Good question. Um, yeah, I think, um, several things there and, and one is, as I've already kind of mentioned and, and, uh, experienced trail runners, uh, always talk about and know is to take it slow, uh, is in literally, you don't have to run fast. Uh, <laughs> and so that aspect of it, don't, you don't need to get out there. These aren't 500, uh, meters, sp- you know, quick, runs and things like that uh take it slow take it at your own pace don't try to increase your your distances or your time too drastically uh, definitely don't go past that 10 percent max is as you do uh start to uh, run more uh and get out there uh invest in a good map uh whether that is i i like to have a backup so a good hard copy of a map of the areas that you're running in along Are you with talking the, about paper 
Well, you know, water. Yeah, paper. Yeah, you know, I know it's old. Yeah, I school. carry a paper map as well. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, just in case the battery on the phone dies or something. I mean, you can certainly, exactly. Yes. You can certainly have all the. There's a lot of great apps that are on, yep. on the phone. Uh, yep. Well, yeah, um, as long as the phone's working, that's exactly correct. Yeah, <laughs> I've bumped mine in water on a couple uh, river crossings on trail runs before, and it hasn't turned out well, even though it's supposed to be waterproof. Right. So, uh, you know, you never know what could happen there. So I mean, those things uh, invest in, in good equipment uh, when you're ready and can for it. So whether that's a, a pack and, you know, a bladder, water bottles, things like that, uh, a headlamp um, and, and use use that stuff and practice with it on shorter runs and that before you get out there and decide you're going to do a, a, a several hour night run or something like that, for example, is, is time goes on. And if you can and, and it's there's not COVID going on in that and there's some group runs and, and or uh, fun runs and things like that, uh, I would definitely encourage people uh, when it's safe to be social uh, and join in, in in those things and events because you'll learn a ton that way. Uh, you really will. Awesome. Thanks, man. Mm -hmm. um, Jen, you've, uh, you've obviously um, completed a number of distance. Can you talk about what your progression was um, for moving up to, uh, to get to the 100 miles? Did you bounce all over the place with distances or did you have more of a natural progression? Uh, well, I guess I progressed right on up um, in the short of it. I did the 50K, and then I decided to do a 100-miler, and I did the 50-mile on the lead-up to that. But um, I kind of say, like, the, the races pick me. <laughs> 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 I had done Yamacraw, which is a 50K in Tennessee. Um, but even before I did that race, I was seeing um, advertisements for No Business 100, and the 100 course was just beautiful at this point i hadn't run more than like 35 miles in a race or, or ever and, and you know in facebook it just keeps coming up and i go look at the website and i was like oh this is just beautiful i've got to do it but they only have 100 they didn't even have a 50 they didn't have nothing and i was like oh well okay well what what exactly do you have to do to run 100 miles <laughs> um, so that's really what made me jump from like 50k to I just had to run this race and it, it didn't disappoint. It's a gorgeous race in Tennessee and Kentucky. Um, and so then I was like, well, if I have a year, I have 10 months to plan. Then I planned like more 50 Ks I planned a 50 miler and a night run. And um, I love planning and brainstorming. That's, that's my favorite <laughs> in life is just take out a pad of paper and, a pen and start making plans. So um, I had it all scripted out. I, it's going to run all these different races to lead up. And yeah, so that's how I got to the hundred mile race, but I did do the 50 on the way there. You had a great build up this year too, um, with the Buffalo mountain time race. Yeah. Uh, you want to talk about that? Buffalo mountain is great. It's in Tennessee, Eastern Tennessee, and it was called Holston river for a long time. And so I did it the first two years that it was Holston river and then it moved locations and changed name and it's a loop race. It's only it depends on the year, but it's like a mile and a quarter or a mile and a half loop. And I thought that I would just hate that. That sounds awful. Um, I could never do it for an A race. I will admit, I just can't do loop races for <laughs> a serious race because it's just too, there's a lot of reasons why. But as far as a social experience and a training opportunity, loop races are great. I mean, you can try out new gear, you can try new fueling. You're never far from your stuff. There's always people there. That's where I did my first overnight run. So, and now it's become a tradition. I haven't missed a year in four years and I look forward to it every year because I see the same people and I get to try cool. shoes or <laughs> whatever I need to do. So I got, um, got my hundred K in there on the way. Right on. That was beautiful this year. Yeah. I mean, touching on this year a little bit, um, it, like my, my true joy is in watching, um, you know, uh, people like Jen, um, kind of progress, um, <laughs> seeing, <laughs> seeing Jen move along this year, um, and seeing her, uh, her paces progress. Um, Jen, I really enjoyed, uh, watching your training, you know, because we, we, as we approached rim to river, I just said, you're ready. You know, like you could just see, uh, just how much you had, you know, how far you had come, which was amazing. Um, 
So I, I really enjoyed watching that this year. Um, and Nate and I actually uh, caught each other on the trail. Um, uh, you know, uh, I think it was, I think it was right after Rim to River, wasn't it, Nate? It wasn't long after Rim to River. Yeah, I think it was only a couple of weeks after that. Happened. And we were just saying, you know, just how impressed both of us were with uh, with your performance there. Um, yeah, so, Jen, if you want to, you had a you had a PR there, correct? I did. Yeah, I broke thirty hours for the hundred mile, which is really good for me as a back of the pack hundred mile runner. So, um, uh, it was fantastic. Um, I was super proud of you. Um, yeah, it was she did. Cool. I'll, I'll add, she did really, really well in my opinion. Uh, just from a crewing and spectator uh, point at this, um, you know, this is her third hundred mile that I've crewed and or, and or watched her do, and I'm not even sure how many fifty uh, k's, thirty k's, uh, fifty milers she's done. She's built up for quite a while over the years, and, and did a lot more of those earlier on. So I've watched her run trail races for years. That's the best I've ever seen her. Uh, She was very strong. Um, I met her at the 45 mile uh, pacer pickup, and this was already covered in another podcast, of course. Uh, And she was, she was doing great uh, and just continued that through the entire thing. She, she, uh, she did excellent. She uh, not only set her PR, but she, uh, she looked really, really good throughout the entire event doing that. Did you pace her there, Nate? I did. Yeah, I, I paced her from uh, for them the forty-five mile uh, point, which is where pacers could first pick up at. Or uh, excuse me, I'm sorry, the fifty-five mile point uh, for them. Uh, forty-five miles left to go. Uh, uh, point there in the race and paced her from that point. Which was his longest run at the time, too. So. Yes. Kind of like, you know, I mean, yeah, I was right in the race, but it was also a big deal for him because 45 miles and that took me, what, 13 hours or something to do the walk? Yeah, it was a little over 13 hours, I think, that we were out there and running. Yeah, that is my uh, longest running distance uh, for sure uh, up up until this point uh, and, uh, and pacing. That's super yeah. awesome. Um, how did that feel for each of you um, from, you know, from each of your perspectives? Jen, how did it feel to have Nate out there? It, it was great. I know with Nate that, that I'm going to be okay. <laughs> I, I mean, when we first crewed me, but he's a natural crew, first of all. He, he's very detail-oriented. He truly cares, you know, that I get through it. And so he's just, if you could clone him, and um, he could make a lot of money as a crew person. <laughs> he just, he's a great crew. I will say at our first, that, that no business race, we almost got a divorce there on the trail when he was pacing me the last, I don't know, 50 <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was rough. Was, um, I mean, he did everything right, but I was, um, I got to like mile 98, hit three miles to go, and I just, it was like a light switch, and I was like, I'm not, I'm walking the last, I have an hour and a half to go three miles, I'm walking, it's it, I'm done. And he was doing the good pacer thing, like, come on, let's just run to that tree. After a while, I was like, I, I'm not even going to look at you right now if you don't get out of my face. <laughs> <laughs> this noise is not going to work. <laughs> and so he finally just, you know, it, uh, he didn't yell back at me, which must have t- taken a lot of um, risk. <laughs> we, so we went those three miles, and which turned into almost four. And um, we came to the, we saw the finish line in sight. I was like, oh, thank God, you know. And he's like, wait, <laughs> what? What do you want? You know, he's like, I'm proud of you. You did it. I'm very proud of you. He gave me a kiss. And I was like, aw. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> so he, after that, the, the pacing is, I think he's learned to work with my moods when I get to, um, I try not to be in bitch mode too much either, but it went very flawlessly at Rim to River. We've run together enough over these years and um, yeah, we didn't get a divorce this past race. So that was good. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> 45 miles. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and and Nate, from your perspective, um, you know, like, how do you how do you see things? Um, you know, I, obviously, Jen just crewed you. Um, you know, how did that work out on your end? Well, it worked out great, and um, and I hear a lot of stories and have talked to other ultra runners who they will not, whether it's the husband or or the wife. Uh, crew and or work with that person for their races and events <laughs> because yeah because they will get a divorce like they just can't right. do it so, 
they'll have other friends or, or people in that, you know, do those things with them. And, and the other person will be a pure spectator or something like that. So yeah. I, I, I understand that too. There, that can happen. Um, from my perspective, I think it helps that we're both endurance athletes and it's easy when you are that to understand what the other person is going through at that point. Um, so it's easy for me to at least to relate to how she's feeling that she's, that she's tired. She's exhausted. She's in pain. These things hurt. Here's what's going on. So having that understanding and knowledge and that, that kind of sympathy, uh, to then, help your runner problem solve whatever is going on and get them to the end as fast as possible. That's what I'm always thinking about in my head. And at the very back of my head, making sure in my head that I'm keeping myself uh, with enough water and fuel for myself. But the primary point there is, is your runner and making sure how they're doing. Uh, so that's what I think about. I don't get worried about Jen, even when she shows up at Rim to River. And the first thing she announces to me when I'm getting ready to pace her is that she thinks she, she fell a while ago. She thinks she broke her thumb. She pulls off her glove and her thumb is like 10 shades of black and blue. And I'm like, yeah, I think you did break your thumb, but she, she's not, you know, she's not crying. She's not upset. She, you know, it's not bothering her. Uh, she doesn't need it to run. And so we're like, yeah, it is. Well, we're good to go. And we, you know, take off and start going down the trail, <laughs> you know, for the for basically the second half of this thing uh, and doing that. So, and then, uh, I do a good, I, I think I do a good job of, of checking in with her. So for that event in particular, I would, uh, when I knew, I knew when we were getting close to aid stations and things like that. And so I would check in with her as to how she's doing, how she's feeling and what she would want me to get for her first when, uh, when we're coming to an aid station. And I would do that a mile or two before we hit the next one. Uh, so I already know when we get there, get her water bottles or, or, or get this for her or go grab her drop bags or whatever the case may be. Right. No, that's, that's perfect. Um, you know, I, I, I think, um, the best crew people are the ones that can be compassionate, that do understand you and what you're going through, but also can be, um, able to provide tough love, um, you know, um, I think those are kind of the three components you need in your, uh, especially in your, your captain, um, which is definitely my wife. Um, she will call me every foul name in the book when she knows <laughs> that I can go faster and she will be compassionate when she knows that I am really hurting and, you know, <laughs> she closed the now, so, uh, you need both sides of the tail. Um, so, um, you know, it's good to have those people in your corner. Um, so, you know, when you're, when you're selecting crew, be keeping those qualities in mind, um, you know, and, and know if they're going to be okay for, you know, 30 plus hours straight. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's the other big component. Uh, yeah. What, um, when you're, you're getting near to that, uh, uh, that, you know, you're, you're over 24 hours and, and they're telling you that they're tired. <laughs> yeah. That's, uh, that's probably not the person that you uh, you want. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, probably a, a very key rule there. Don't ever complain to the runner about how you are doing. Or that's, right. that's right. <laughs> and that's true. Uh, My first 100 there at No Business, I mean, I was so self-absorbed. I had no idea what he was doing. And I, we also ran with um, the amazing Shannon Polly, who was my pacer and afterward they're sitting talking about things that they went through like they got lost down this road in the middle of nowhere like i think she got a flat tire and she paid someone in beer to change it like they had all these adventures and i had no idea what anyone was going through i was so right just focused yep. on myself so you you need a cruise durable <laughs> yeah <laughs> and yeah. Things, you know can pivot and do things on the run and even with art lobe you know nate came in this is his first basically his first race and he knew what he needed and he went through it. And at the end he was kind of like, okay, start to just talk. And I'm like, go, <laughs> love you. Go. <laughs> <laughs> Time to get going. Took off. I knew time was important to him, even though it wasn't a race, um, sure. you know, but his cycling coach had stopped to see him and, you know, we were, they were starting to talk a little bit and I'm like, oh, time to go. <laughs> like, Bye now. <laughs> you talk about Bye. It. You're like, you, you're going to get cold. So, uh, that's yeah. great. <laughs> uh, so, um, that brings us to our, our kind of closing question here. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, this was something I, I wanted you guys to, to feel comfortable with. So, you know, whatever you want to share or not share, that's totally fine. But 
you know, give us a moment where you guys feel is, is one of your, your favorite moments uh, in your running adventures. We have so many. It's just amazing. I was thinking about this the other night. And I'm like, we need to write this down so that we're in the old folks' home. We can remember <laughs> yeah. stuff we did. <laughs> but uh, I think Rim to River so far is is my greatest memory because we met in West Virginia. We left there in like um, 06 or something like that. I don't remember now. Um, but West Virginia has always been home to us. So it was a uh, a special place to go to. We've always like gotten an Airbnb or a cabin and made it almost a vacation when we do hundred milers because we like to explore and we make it more than a race. So just to go with him back to West Virginia and run in a place that's really special to us. And, th- and there was a moment in the race where I did this totally stupid thing and I must have taken my headlamp out at an aid station. And so when it got dark and I went to pull it out, it wasn't there. I must have lost it somewhere. <laughs> I mean, who loses their headlamp at 100 miles? It was awful. So I'm sitting there swearing and freaking out. I'm just so mad at myself. And I had a cell phone light, and I knew I had a spare light in my drop bag at the next aid station. So I was just really mad at myself. And this other guy was like, I'll run with you. You know, I can't just let you go down the mountain by yourself. (laughs) So uh, I was okay. I had that cell phone light, and I had that. But I texted Nate, and I was like, screwed up. You know, I lost my lamp. I don't know what I'm going to do, but I'm pretty sure I've got a spare. I'm like, just letting you know, because I'm going to be late, you know, and all he texted back was just get to me and I've got you. And I was like, that made me feel so much better (laughs) because I was like, whether I do or don't have this light in my drop bag, I don't know what he's going to do. He may not know. He might be figuring it out too. He's not going to tell me, well, that was dumb. (laughs) Why'd you do that? I don't have a light. He's just like, just get to me and you'll be okay. And I'm, I'm, okay, I know he's going to be figuring it out, whether he's begging someone for a lamp or whatever. And it, so it was just a special vacation in a lot of ways to go back to West Virginia. We've never run 45 miles together. Um, and just to be a team like that, where he's like, you're fine. I gotcha. So, that was a good moment. And it's a PG one. So <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Uh, how about you, Nate? Um, yeah, I totally agree. Uh, I love being able to get out there and, and run with Jen. That's a, that's a, a big thing. Anytime we can get a chance to, it doesn't have to be a long run at all, but even if it's just something local running around the area, I think when I think about all the memories and that of, of times, I think one of the proudest times I had was for her was when I was just crewing and it was her first a uh, hundred mile race. Uh, once again, no business over there in Kentucky. Uh, I was at an aid station in the middle of the night. Uh, it was a, somewhere around the mile 60 mark of that event. And it was the first year they had it. And they had a lot of people that, that did it that year. And they got the mileage and they got the elevation, excuse me, wrong uh, a little bit. They, they underestimated the elevation for the course. And so I was at this aid station in the middle of the night waiting on Jen and, and Shannon to, uh, to show up. And it looks like an, a mash unit in there. Uh, I mean, there's people just coming in while I'm waiting in just terrible shape. I saw so many people drop there. I think half the race dropped there of all the drops that they had that year. It had to occur at that aid station. So anyways, they come in uh, and when they get there. And, you know, Jen has both her poles out. She's got a pretty good limp uh, to her, uh, you know, and, and has been dealing with some, some things and issues. Uh, up to that point and going, but we got her, we got her fixed up. She got food. She, she got what she needed and they took right off again. And uh, I mean, she, you know, she persevered through what all these other people could not do. Uh, she came in, in the same kind of condition that some of these people did. And that always stood out to me. And I guess it still does now thinking back to it. Uh, even several years later, I'm like, she is just one tough, tough person. Uh, she can just persevere. She's going to do whatever it takes. So, Later on, when, yeah, she has a broken thumb, for example, and she's talking about her most recent one, I'm like, yeah, you know, that's, I've already watched her do worse than that and make it through stuff. So I'm like, yeah, you'll be fine. It'll be okay. Let's just get you going and, and to the end. So that, that moment always stands out to me related to Jen and, and her running. I'll, I'll share one of my moments just to, to be fair. Um, I don't think I've ever shared this moment um, publicly. <laughs> uh, 
so we were, um, Beth and I were in college. That's, that's where we met. Um, and you know, we were obviously on the, the cross country team together and we traveled to Disney for, um, an invite at Disney. Um, we got to stay in the wilderness cabins. Obviously the, the girls had their own cabin and, and the guys had their own. Um, but, um, you know, we raced on the golf course there and, uh, both teams won. So we, we got, um, about a two foot tall Mickey mouse statue with him having the, the, you know, number one finger up, um, which was super cool to try to bring through, uh, um, you know, the, uh, security at the airport. Cause we got to put him <laughs> through the, uh, the x-ray and you get to see Mickey mouse, with his number one finger sticking up in the x-ray. That, that was pretty humorous. Everybody got a kick out of that, but, um, <laughs> So the, the races obviously went really well, but uh, we were treated to a, a free day in the magical kingdom. Um, and so, uh, you know, we're, we're off the high of, of a great race. And, uh, you know, here are the two of us enjoying our time together um, and uh, going on Space Mountain. And uh, I think we were waiting in line for uh, the Haunted Mansion. And, uh, you know, it's just I think at that point I was like, you know, I could spend the rest of my life with this woman. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> that is amazing. That's great. It was a, yeah, it was, thank you. It was a, you know, it was a, it was a fun trip and uh, it, you know, it was uh, just a great memory. Uh, we've gone back since with our kids. It, it wasn't as magical. <laughs> 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 and that's when you were done having kids. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, to be fair, it was, uh, it was spring break, you know, and uh, it was just, uh, there was just too many people in the park. Um, and then there was a, a, a lightning storm that came and they closed the park down early. So, uh, you know, not, and my daughter was so young, she was scared of Pluto, you know, Pluto came out oh. and, uh, she freaked out. Oh my God. <laughs> so, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll give it another go at some point, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can't, can't really the magic of that one day, but, That's a great um, I, I really sincerely appreciate you both coming on and sharing your stories. Um, you know, congratulations on a, uh, well-earned finish at, on the art lobe and as well as on the rim to river respective to both of you. Thank you so much. Um, really enjoyed our conversation and hearing your stories too. Thank you. Yeah, me too. Thank you for having us on. Thanks for having us. Absolutely guys. And, um, I'm sure we'll, we'll probably hear more from you guys in the future cause you got some fun stuff planned. So <laughs> hopefully looking forward to it. Thank you, Jennifer and Nate, for your time and uh, for sharing your story, as always. Um, certainly appreciate you guys and um, uh, wish you guys well in, in your future endeavors. Um, and uh, you know, to all of you, as this is coming out on Christmas Eve, I, I wish you a, a very Merry Christmas and, of course, a very Happy New Year's. I'll have a, a new episode out next week. Um, I've recorded with Sam Reed who has um, just broken the unsupported FKT record on the um, Foothills Trail. Um, Sam is a good friend and training partner. Uh, he lives about five miles down the road from me, so we share a lot of time together training, and um, he won Hellbender in 2019. So fun conversation. Uh, I am also trying to um, get a hold of Kyle Curtin. Uh, Kyle just broke the FKT for Pitchell in a blazing fast time. So um, I'm hoping that conversation works out, but with the holidays and his travel, uh, I'm not sure if we can or not, but I certainly hope. So uh, stay tuned next week for that. Um, in the meantime, I, I really hope everybody enjoys their Christmas and New Year's and time with their family in this special holiday season. Um, I certainly appreciate all of you and you know, your listening and uh, just the support that everybody has shown. Um, my newsletter just came out. Um, I just published that. Uh, so if you do not subscribe, but would like to just hop over to my website, mrrunningpains.com and you can subscribe there. All of my old, uh, newsletters as well as podcasts are all archived on the website. So you can see, uh, see those if, uh, if you haven't subscribed and want to see those. Um, I also post them on my Facebook page, the MR running pains coaching Facebook page. Um, so you can uh, give that a like and a follow and, 
you'll know when things pop out like the newsletter or podcasts or YouTube videos. Uh, my YouTube channel is Aaron Saft. Um, and uh, we'll be working on some new content over the, uh, the Christmas break here. So uh, stay tuned for that. And um, what else is going on? Coaching uh, brought on a new coach in Thad McNeil. A uh, young man who uh, I've you know had the joy of working with uh, in my time at Footer X, as well as running with. Um, that is a, a great young man. He uh, crewed for me at Cruel Jewel, uh, unfortunately when I cramped up and, <laughs> and had to pull out. But um, Dad's been around, and I uh, really enjoy his uh, <clears throat> his, his uh, perspective and uh, his motivation. Uh, he's you know just very uh, 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 very much into coaching and running and uh he's just a, a joy to be around so i'm looking forward to having him on board um on my coaching staff and um you know, a few new changes so uh, if you want to visit the website again mrrunningpains.com you can see uh, i'll be working on adding thad there and ways you can reach out to him if you feel like he's a good fit for you um, as well as for me if, if you'd like to reach out to me about coaching uh, you can do so through the website or my email is runningpains at gmail.com um, thad is mrrunningpains thad at gmail.com and uh but you like i said you'll be able to reach out through us through the website and, um, um, I hope, uh, I hope, you know, if you're looking for a coach, you give us a shot, uh, at least have a conversation with us, see if it's something that might be uh, conducive for you. Um, my coaching rate in 2021 is going to be $125. Um, just so everybody knows, um, I changed that on the website. Um, but, uh, hopefully that's, that's still within reason for you, uh, per month. And so anyway. Lots of changes, lots going on. Uh, like I said, a lot of this is in the newsletter, so you can check that out. Um, and once again, very Merry Christmas to all. Um, can't wait to talk to you guys next time. I'll see you next week. Till then, take care and keep running.